Take a few deep, long breaths. And relax your whole body. From the top of your head to low of your toes. Closely observe each part of your body and make sure are they relaxed. In this beautiful morning, we all together sitting in front of the Buddha, we are going to develop our loving thoughts. We are going to focus on our breath. Be grateful for this moment. Be grateful for yourself. Breathe in mindfully, breathe out mindfully. Let's focus on your breath for a few moments. Let's start our loving friendliness thoughts. Let's practice loving kindness meditation. Firstly, feel yourself as your best friend. You are the best friend of yourself. That's why you all came to this temple. As a best friend, you are always want to take care of yourself mentally and physically. Again, feel yourself as your best friend. And wish to yourself, bless to yourself. Try to be a loving and kind person to yourself. Think. May I learn to forgive and accept myself. May I be safe and protected from inner and outer dangers.
may i learn to care for myself with joy and ease may i be strong and healthy mentally and physically while you are repeating these words try to feel the meaning otherwise you are just repeating words Our mind is always having thoughts. Thoughts are arising, thoughts are remaining, and thoughts are disappearing. If you have any difficult thoughts in your mind, try to focus them. It could be anger, jealousy, ego. or oh, many thoughts <coughs> and kindly make a wish may i be free from anger may i be free from jealousy ego hatred may i be free from all negative thoughts Now slowly focus on your loved ones. Imagine your whole family members. Maybe they are in different places or different states or different countries. But we can always connect to heart to heart. If you are really having some difficult time with some of your family members slowly let it go
May all my loved ones be filled with loving kindness. May they be free from inner and outer dangers. May they be able to take care of themselves happily. May not any difficulties come to them. May they be strong and healthy mentally and physically. If you want to change your posture, you can change it any time. Do it mindfully and slowly. Imagine in this moment, you are the one of the loveliest person in this world. Your heart is full of love, full of compassion. If you are really loved to yourself, it means you are always going to take care of others. Be grateful for your loving thoughts, your beautiful mind. Now this loving motivation thoughts, let's focus on our breathing process. Slowly focus your natural, ordinary breathing process. Bring your attention to the tip of your nose and take each breath mindfully. Many thoughts, sounds may distract you. Let them come and go. Breathe in mindfully. Breathe out mindfully. Let's spend some silent moments with your breathing process.
Don't think about future. Don't think about past. Enjoy this present moment with focusing on your natural ordinary breath. When you are breathing, you can see there are four types of breath. Long breath in and out, short breath in and out. When you see long breath, think I am having long breath. When you see short breath, understand you are having short breath. Breathe in mindfully, breathe out mindfully. Our mind is always wandering, we call monkey mind. If you are wondering, just know you are having thoughts and come back to your breathing process.
we can breathe next breath we can breathe past breath we can just breathe on this moment we call present moment your breath is always teaching you to stay focus it's is it's teaching how to enjoy this present moment keep focusing on your natural ordinary breath mindfulness mean awareness and we are always learning and we are always focusing about we are always awareing about ourselves our thoughts and also whatever we are doing in our daily life and also another meaning of meditation is introspection we are always observing our thoughts it is a deep part of our meditation practice now your mind and body are relaxed peaceful and calm please bring your hands together in front of your heart be grateful for this moment be grateful for your practice also be grateful for buddha and his beautiful teachings finally be grateful for this place without this place we can practice we can't practice as a group and same time make a strong determination to practice your meditation every day at least 5 or 10 minutes we all are called human it's mean who can develop who can cultivate who can raise their mind up to the maximum level it's mean we all have that ability to develop our inner world our good mind this practice will help you to develop your good mind May peace be with you may all the living beings be well be happy be peaceful thank you so much slowly open your eyes okay let's start our chanting practice page number 4 <coughs> please chant together 
नमो तस् भगवत हर हतो संबुदस् नमो तस् भगवत हर हतो संबुदस् नमो तस् भगवत हर हतो संबुदस् बुद्धन शरण गच्छामि दमन शरण गच्छा संगं शरण गच्छामि दुतीयंपि दुतीयंपिधम शरण गच्छामि दुतीयंपि संगं शरण गच्छामि ततीयंपि बुद्धं शरण ततीयंपि धम्म शरण गच्छामि ततीयंपि संगं शरण गच्छा अनिच्छावत संकारा उपाद पयदमिनु उपाजित्वा निरुच्छान्ति ते संगोपसमुसुको सब्बे सत्ता अवेरा हुन्तु सब्बे सत्ता अभ्यापज्जा सब्बे सत्ता अनेगा हुन्तु सब्बे सत्ता सुखे अत्ता नम परिहरन्तु मनोपुब्बंग मादम्मा मनोसेता मनु चे पदुचेन भासते वा करोते वा ततो नंदुकमन्वेति कंगवहातो पदं मनोपुब्बंगमादम्मा मनोसेता मनो मनसाचे पसन्नेन बासते वा करोते वा ततो नंसुक मन्वे छायाव अनपायने मन इस द फॉरेन ऑफ स्टेट्स मन इस जी विद द करप्टेड मान वन शुड आई दिस पीक ओ एम Suffering follows caused by that, as does the wheel follow the ox's hoof. Mind is the foreign of the state. <coughs> if it's a clear and confident mind, one should I this speak or act. Happiness follows caused by that, as does the shadow of it never leaves. We believe. We believe in generosity towards others. We believe the skillful, noble path is marked by generosity. We believe generosity has many levels. Think generously, speak generously, act generously. We believe generosity is the heart of our spiritual practice, and this practice allows us to become more open 
accepting and forgiving. We believe extending generosity to ourselves and others is a direct way of healing division, bringing joy and nurturing this spiritual community for years to come. My wish, may I become at all times, both now and forever, a protector for those without protection, a guide for those who have lost their way, a ship for those with an ocean to cross, a sanctuary for those in danger, a lamp for those without light, a place of refuge for lack shelter, and a servant to all in need. By means of this meritorious deed, may I never join with the unwise, only the wise, until the time I attain Nirvana. Okay, today we have a special Dhamma talk, and our wonderful friend, our noble friend, also our brother, Tyler Liuke. And he's our board president, and also he's, uh, he's a big part of our temple. And he's uh, doing a, such a wonderful help to continue our temple. And we are really grateful for you, Tyler. And I'm kindly invite you to share your beautiful message with all of us. How's this? Can everybody hear me? Good morning. Some of you new timers might not realize it, but we got some OGs in the house. Some of the original uh, practitioners from when Bante was a young little monk in a leaky basement downstairs, just trying to put together a few English words so that people might consider coming back. So I'm glad to see some old timers and lots of new folks. Charlie, it's good to see you. Thank you for traveling this far. Joy and Wahid, thank you guys for coming. Our special guests all the way from Carbondale. Uh, you guys will hear from Joy in a minute. I'm going to invite her up to help me uh, share something, but we're really grateful to have you here, as always. Uh, I've been given some thought uh, to some things lately. I don't know if you guys have that. I, uh, sometimes if it's about business or my work life, I call it professional pondering or mulling, professional mulling. And then in my spiritual and personal life, I like tend to mull on things and chew on them a while. And the pandemic has um, created a smorgasbord of things to chew on, wouldn't you say? Lots of things to consider. And um, actually, I didn't, I didn't think of this uh, until I saw Todd when I walked in, because uh, Todd used to live in San Francisco. And it, it, every time I think about San Francisco, I think of this monk um, that I... I've had the opportunity to meet in this role working with Bonte all these years. I get these like incredibly weird and amazing opportunities to meet people. Um, and so there's an American monk uh, that uh, in 1979, he and another uh, monk brother of his decided to go on a pilgrimage and um, uh, for peace. And they uh, traveled 800 miles from somewhere near LA all the way up to Okaya on the other side of San Francisco. And they traveled along the Pacific Coast. Many of you probably have at least seen pictures or maybe had the opportunity to drive that incredible drive along Highway 1, going through Big Sur, and um, really, many would say, one of the most beautiful drives in the world. And these monks uh, did it uh, on foot. And what they did was they would take three steps, and then they would stop and do a full bow. Then they would stand back up and take three more steps and do a full bow. Uh, and if you ever, his book is out of print, but it is called Three Steps, One Bow, and you can buy it used on eBay. Um, he's really an amazing guy. I especially love learning from American monks because I feel like they've had the, the lived experience that I've had. And so I, it, it helps me to feel like I know how to integrate the teachings of the Buddha into my life because these guys have sort of modeled that for me in a way that, um, you know, other teachers um, don't have the same lived experience I have. So I have sometimes have a little harder time connecting the dots. So these guys walked this 800 miles and uh, what happened was their sangha and then many other sanghas in that time 
would uh, meet them along the way in vans and bring them food, bring them water, um, actually often brought them new fresh robes, gave them baths, first aid, because they were doing this, can you imagine, the physical toll of doing that 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 far for that long. And when I talked with him, uh, at, when I got to meet him, I'd already read that story and it had been very moving to me for a long time. I really believe in the kind of the metaphorical concept of three steps, one bow. Like we got to keep going and we have to integrate wisdom in order to keep going. Like I really appreciate that. And uh, what he said to me was that the hardest part was not the physical toll. The hardest part was that people realized that they had a lot of time, these monks had a lot of time on their hands. To walk 800 miles at that pace gave them a lot of time to think. And the Sangha kept showing up and would take various, various people would walk with them for small parts of that journey and they would share their sorrow and their struggle and, and all of the stuff that they were up against. And so the bulk of that trip for them was hearing people's sorrow. And what he said was the hardest part was that he was in the most beautiful place on earth while hearing some of the most deepest sorrows of the earth. And he said that the reconciliation of that extreme beauty and that extreme pain is, is what was the most impactful thing for that whole journey for him. And it's been the guiding influence of his life is how do we reconcile extreme sorrow and extreme joy and beauty in the same life, in the same lived experience. And um, I don't want to assume what other people's experience have been, but th this is how I would describe the pandemic for me, is uh, in a state of confusion, bewilderment, uh, and pondering about how, uh, how I could be living so many blessings of this pandemic, the ability to slow down, to really take time out for time in, uh, to mend relationships that had been neglected, um, to really slow down and work on my inner self, on my physical space, on so many things, so many blessings. And Bonte and I talk, you know, very regularly, and very often I would be like, sitting outside at the temple here, getting ready to walk to the farmer's market and complaining about having to wear my mask while he's in Sri Lanka with hundreds of people at the doors of Sanathasuya waiting to be fed or wondering how they're going to stay safe tonight. And we would, we would be on the phone wrestling with this, these blessings that I'm amidst, the sorrow they're amidst, um, and, and like, like how do you, how do you navigate that? And so, um, I want to I want to just share something that that my pondering led to, and so uh, let me just begin with this. So I decided to, to compile a list of headlines uh, from the last eighteen months or so, from from the pandemic starting whenever that was, January, February, March of twenty twenty until now. These are just some headlines in the news: mysterious illness in China. Bushfires in Australia rage on. 4,042 new cases in the United States. Toilet paper hoarding. Global run on supplies for healthcare workers. COVID-19 outbreak in U.S. nursing homes. Kobe Bryant. Hong Kong health workers strike over the coronavirus. Countries ban the use of the word coronavirus. 1,302 dead in the U.S. Italy, coronavirus surge strains hospitals. Flatten the curve. Death toll in U.S. blows past 60,000. Rose Garden Super Spreader Event. COVID-19 is not the flu. Stimulus checks. U.S. forfeits global leadership role. People of color disproportionately affected by COVID-19. 
locust swarms. Moscow doubles COVID death toll. EU sets new list of approved travel partners, and the United States is not on it. I can't breathe. Mask mandates. Americans lonely and anxious during pandemic. Ventilator shortage. Vaccinations. Vaxxers versus non-vaxxers. A million vaccine doses going unused. Unmasking. Remasking. Here's some additional headlines from the exact same day of each of those other headlines. Clearer visibility is allowing a view of the majestic Himalayan mountain ranges that has not been seen in three decades. NASA satellite images are showing significant reductions in air pollution over huge parts of the United States. One week of lockdown has brought nitrogen dioxide concentration to its lowest in a generation. Air pollution started dropping after March 16th, 2020, and has dropped every single day since. Elephants are joyfully strolling on the empty streets of Wayandmar. <laughs> Previously believed to be extinct turtles arrive for mast nesting on multiple shores across the world. People singing from their windows in major cities around the world every evening, 8 p.m. Adam Costello becomes the only second person in the world cured of HIV. One world together at home a concert organized by Global, Global Citizen Movement and the World Health Organization featuring Lady Gaga, Paul McCartney, and others raises $128 million for coronavirus vaccine in 12 minutes. A 103-year-old grandma beat COVID-19 and celebrates with a Bud Light. <laughs> <laughs> Drive-in movie theaters have made a surging comeback. Drive-in concerts are now a thing. Brady, uh, Tom Brady and Peyton Manning play golf with greats like Phil Mickelson and Tiger Woods in The Match for COVID-19 Relief, raising $100 million in 17 minutes. Restaurants share, share their secret recipes so we can make them at home. Restaurants got really creative to enforce social distancing, including pool noodle hats and bumper boats. <laughs> An opera performed live to a beautiful audience of houseplants and then donated them to healthcare workers and nursing homes across the U.S. People around the country brush up on their sewing skills, making masks for people who need them most. Lady Gaga gave us a new album for sweaty dance floor moves in our living room. Americans have rushed to adopt and foster pets in, in need during the pandemic, and shelters are empty. Sure, we might have all gained a little weight, but we've rediscovered our love for old hobbies like baking and gardening. Puzzles and board games are cool again. <laughs> TikTok has blown up and our boredom has been cured. <laughs> Distilleries, both small and large around the country, have used their resources to produce badly needed hand sanitizer. Major companies like 3M and Apple have pooled resources or shifted production to make millions of masks to help keep people safe. Ford, GM, Tesla, and other automakers have reworked their systems to make ventilators and other medical devices to help with the pandemic. We learned that homeschooling is really hard and have finally recognized teachers for the heroes that they are. 
NASA named its Washington, D.C. headquarters after Mary Jackson, its first black female engineer. Zoom flubs bring comic relief. Banksy resurfaced. A runner completes an entire marathon on his front porch. Toddlers find ways to have weekly play dates with their grandparents through a window. After casting 40 seasons of The Bachelor and The Bachelorette, ABC finally casts first black male lead. A principal surprises each of his 98 high school seniors with yard signs to make them feel special since celebrations were canceled amid the virus. Smaller movies and hidden gems are suddenly at our fingertips thanks to streaming. Hamilton the movie is released. Virtual wine tasting is actually a thing. We've embraced our gray hair. Well, sort of. <laughs> we realized how much we love and need sports and its ability to unite us. Musicians take to social media to give us personal concerts from their home. Wearing sweatpants and t-shirts has become acceptable fashion choices all day, every day. <laughs> Museums open up their collections to audiences virtually. Sure, it's still better to see art in person, but it's not a bad way to spend your lunch break. Smithsonian, anyone? You can now virtually explore national parks, zoos, and even Mars. China takes action to ban the consumption, farming, and sale of wild animals. Perhaps the biggest positive emerging from this crisis is the realization that we humans are capable of global collective action. If the stakes are high enough, we can take these challenges together and most importantly of all, rapidly abandon business as usual. So I've been mulling over how do we live with sorrow and heartache and joy and blessings at the same time. And uh, I don't know that some of us are very good at that, myself included. You know, if you watch the news, we don't hear about those good headlines very often, do we? And uh, most of us, myself, certainly at the front of the pack, find that my nature is attracted now to what's wrong and what's negative. And I have to be conscious about bringing myself back to what's positive, good, and right. Even though the evidence shows there's actually more right in the world than in a long time in history. It's just hard to know that because the noise of these other things come up. So I think about um, the path forward of reconciling these, those two things. And this is where the teachings of the Buddha feel um, directly relevant to me. I think in the temple here over the last decade, we've done a lot of work talking about the Four Noble Truths, the Eightfold Path, Many of us have taken our precepts or our bodhisattva vows. Many of us have committed to a life of trying to integrate these teachings into our everyday exchanges. Um, and I believe that the purpose of that is to unite these two really opposing truths, that, that these two things are together. But Joy, would you come up here? I want to introduce today a, um, a new tool. Uh, and this is... Um, it's called Prescription for the Heart. And so Joy is my longtime friend. 37 years we've been near best friends. And Joy, uh, do you want to share where you come from, the, commu the spiritual community you come from? Sure. Good morning. 
Um, and I'd like to say in our tradition, how we greet each other, is we say, Assalamu alaikum, which is Arabic for, may peace be upon you. So, happy to be here. It's a beautiful place to be. Thank you. So, um, I spend a lot of time with Joy over the years. Uh, we pilgrimage back and forth to each other's spiritual communities. She, she and her husband, Wahid, have been here a number of times, and Grant and I have been down to her place a number of times. And um, we, we enjoy uh, getting to know each other's spiritual traditions. And um, there's, there's one, uh, one set of teachings from her tradition that has really impacted me, and it's called this prescription for the heart. And so in addition to all the other tools that you already know of in the Buddhist tradition, um, to kind of combine these two counter-truths, I want to share these with you. Um, the first one, these are just these are a set of uh, practices, very much like the Eightfold Path is a set of practices. The first one is perform a serious, relentless, and moral inventory on yourself. So what does that mean to you? So for me, I, I like to bring these things back to where the rubber meets the road, which means how do I engage with this? And so that particular thing is I get to be mindful and take a look at what have I been carrying? What impressions am I still working with? What are my core values? And how do I work through those things so I can actually express my true self mm. and be in connection with that come from that space love that repent and seek forgiveness of your errors and weaknesses so for this one um i've been i've been practicing something recently where when anything comes up i i consciously search for the most compassionate viewpoint to look at it within and so I love this one about seeking forgiveness for your errors and weaknesses. Um, it's just, for me, there, of course, it's an absolute truth that I'm filled, I fill my days with errors and weaknesses. And um, it's really nice to be sober about that, to be honest about this is who I am. This is the good, the good in me and the struggle in me. And that, that conflict is the same conflict that that monk experienced. It's the same conflict that those headlines experience. Absolutely. Right? Yep. The third one, determine an approach that allows you to live according to your core values. What's that meant for you? So to work, to act in alignment with those things which have the truest meaning and resonance. Mm -hmm. And to follow through on those things, no matter what the obstacles might be, or the pleasure might be, but to try to keep to the balance in the middle. Mm, love that. The next one is make a commitment. Um, and this is uh, what a truth I know is that we're all really good at lying, deceiving, and letting ourselves down, but we're less good at doing that to others mostly. Usually we try to do our best when we've made a commitment to someone else. And so when I think about making a commitment, maybe it's a commitment to a new daily ritual or a new spiritual practice or five minutes of meditation, as Bhante asks us to do, um, making the commitment and then making it to your sangha or your noble community or a noble friend to hold you compassionately accountable is really effective, mm -hmm. really, really effective. Uh, the next one is develop a practice to foster and uh, a continual uh, invocation of praise and gratitude. Mm. I love this one. So for me, this means using my spiritual practices in order to be present to those good things that you mentioned, and also to be an acceptance of those things that are so difficult, so that there's a balance. And in our tradition, we call that walking the middle path. Ours too. <laughs> Gee, what a surprise. Shocker. <laughs> Next one, cast fear, discouragement, discontent, pessimism, and reactive rebellion aside. Me. Yeah. Whoa. <laughs> this one feels really uh, uh, unobtainable to me, so I'll let you talk about it. <laughs> okay. So... 
In another tradition that I practice, um, they talk about taking a fearless and searching moral inventory. And so, to me, this is about continuing that inventory process and watching for those things where I have a negative charge so that I can be present and aware. So in other words, to be involved in personally what I experience, but not to take it personally, mm -hmm. so that those things can be released and mm -hmm. not be coloring my vision. This one, um, if I could edit it, I would. <laughs> because I actually, I, I don't actually believe in casting aside fear and discouragement and discontent. I don't think that's actually possible in my lived experience. What is possible is to pause and not react to those feelings and not to believe them as the truth. And, it, and this probably says that in, in a just a different way. But mm -hmm. the idea, I'm not, I no longer have the expectation that I'm not going to feel fear. I do have the commitment to myself that I'm going to practice not reacting to my fear. You know, it's the relationship to it. The next one, surround yourself with the company of truth and those who support you unconditionally in your process of self-completion. Yeah. That's you and me, baby. It totally That's what we've is, been doing right? for 36 years. Right? Like yeah. find your tribe and be with it. Those who are in alignment with your deepest values. And then in those moments when we are off balance... We can rely on our friends, and our friends can rely on us. I think this one, every, it makes sense to everyone, but we don't give much acknowledgement to how hard this is. How hard you, when, when a friend has been really noble and close to you for a season, but then as your season changes and it no longer has that same chemistry, it's really hard to, yeah. make, to, to maintain con the right connections and to build the right community as we grow, change, and evolve, I think. Um, next one is rid yourself of your, of your defensive posture. What's that mean to you? So as you mentioned before, the idea that I can let go of these things and never experience them, that's realistic to me, at least at this point in my spiritual development. So this means to be mindful of the fact that often when something comes to me, especially if it feels critical, I'll my reaction will be to wall up, push back. But this means practicing having an open and accepting heart. So again, not taking things personally so that I can take in this feedback and then I have an opportunity to correct myself and an opportunity to move into something that gives me a bigger perspective. Mm -hmm. Practice humility by making yourself vulnerable to those you love. Yow. <laughs> That's beautiful. It really is. And that humility and vulnerability, again, bring that openness and allow an exchange, a genuine connection and exchange. I mean, I'm so hungry for connection. Everyone's so hungry for connection. And in community, one of the great things is we get to have that connection in an environment where it's encouraged and fostered and supported. And so we practice the vulnerability and openness here. In a safe space, yeah. Right, so that we can take it out into the greater world and continue to give that. And then, you know, watch how people surround you and are attracted by that. It's just so interesting. I think um, Bhante Sujatha... <clears throat> Many of you have probably heard one of one of his, I think, one of his greatest teachings that I've heard him say over and over and over again, sometimes with a raised voice, is um, don't mistake my kindness for foolishness. Mm -hmm. I really, really love that. And, the, and that his teaching, don't mistake my kindness for foolishness, has helped me practice humility and helped me be more vulnerable because I realized that humility and vulnerability are not weaknesses. They're actually strengths, just like what he's teaching. Mm -hmm. And then our teacher often refers to the only way out is in. Yeah, no way out but in. Um, do all these things even if you don't feel like doing them. <laughs> this is the one I love the most. Um, I'm just, we have somehow got stuck in a repetitive loop um, 
that we shouldn't do things that don't feel good. And that's just ridiculous mm -hmm. <laughs> because we're deluded by society, by the culture, by what's thrown at us. And we don't even know anymore. Many of us have lost touch with what actually feels good. Yeah. And we're, we're like operating under this false impression of what we think it means to feel good. Right. And for me, this one is very much about um, my emotions and my feelings can be good information, but they're crappy instructions. Yes. Yes. I love that. In order to be able to function through these things, we have to be able to stay present. I don't need to expand on this one because this is what we're all sitting here doing is getting present as we can. And uh, I don't know, man, lately for me, um, I noticed when the Delta variant was starting to resurge in the news and kind of become a thing again and we're like, even in the temple, like, okay, are we asking people to put their masks back on? Wait, what does the CDC say? Oh, wait, we're going to piss those people off. Oh, wait, we're going to piss those people off. What do we do? Ah. Mm -hmm. um, what I've noticed is all of that fear, all of my struggle comes from not being present. If I'm truly present in this now moment, it's way less scary and way more manageable. Yeah. And then the last one is let go of this list. Because it's not a list, but first do the work. <laughs> so like even the things you love, let that go too. Even the list, let that go too. Right. It's like, don't be in a fixed, impermanent state. Exactly. So it's really lovely. Thank you, Joy, for joining us. Thank, thank you for you. helping with that. Thank you for having me. Yep. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, so for me, the way I reconcile these, these, these two truths that feel so hard to fit together is by uh, reaffirming my commitment to these kinds of practices. And when I do that, I, 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 I have the capacity to hold both truths at once and to, and to walk forward. Um, so I'm going to post that list for you all on our Facebook page uh, and uh, make it available so you can uh, have access to it as well. And then just I want to talk about a couple of events. Um, I, I had a really lovely moment a, a minute ago. We were, when before practice started, I was sitting with Rebecca, one of our board members and greatest advocates here. And uh, we're doing a, our fundraiser tonight. Um, and there's eight, there's eight tickets left. So we'd love to have you join us if you're uh, interested. But um, what she and, and Tessa were saying to me was, do you realize we've not had a fundraiser since the middle of 2019? And uh, at, we, we, we attempted a bunch, but they, they were canceled. And um, I was so moved when they said that because this place has been, uh, some of you OGs around here know, these fundraisers have been the only way we were able to flush the toilets and turn on these lights, right? And uh, they were our, 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 the only thing we had to keep going. And we've not had one in, what is that, almost three years now. And uh, we are still here and the lights are still on and and I believe the toilets are still flushing. Um, and I just love that because it shows me that this place really matters to people and that when they couldn't give the way we traditionally asked them to, they just found other ways to keep doing it uh, and kept us here and kept us sustained. And uh, so it was really neat to realize it had been that long and we're still okay. Like we just transformed the way we operate and it's kind of wonderful. So eight seats left for that. We'd love to have you. We start at four tonight. Uh, we are opening the temple up at three, so you'd have access to the gift store. We're going to start up here and then go down. The monks are going to lead us in a little meditation before we get started, so we'd love to have you there. Um, we do have uh, a Dhammapada class tomorrow uh, at 11 online uh, with Bhante Bhadia, so uh, please uh, register for that on Eventbrite, uh, and uh, there'll be a Zoom link that's emailed to you an hour prior to the class. Uh, Monday, uh, Bikwini is going to host the online Blue Lotus Temple book, 5.30 to 6.30, so also register for that on Eventbrite. Uh, next Saturday, the 28th, we'll have Gongtopia here to perform from 6.30 to 8.30. Tickets can be purchased uh, here in the gift store. Uh, and then beginning Thursday, September 7th, we're going to begin our online six-week course, Western Philosophy for Buddhists. Uh, each week, the group will meet from 6.30 to 8 to focus on a specific topic. Uh, and so the cost is $50 for six weeks, which goes directly to the temple. And you can find information on that on Eventbrite. 
And then September 12th uh, is uh, a day-long retreat, a Sunday, September 12th, um, at Hackmatack, which is a new retreat center in Richmond that we started. And Bonte is going to lead it. Uh, it's going to be from 9 to 4. That's also on Eventbrite and on our Facebook pages. We're going to have uh, a Sri Lankan lunch served that day. Uh, lots of walking meditations, sitting meditations, some writing exercises. Uh, it'll be a beautiful day. Bonte will be back from Sri Lanka, back from his dad's... Uh, uh, ceremonies from his death, and uh, Bonte's excited to be around all of us again, and we would love to share that day with you. If you're interested, please sign up for that. We have uh, 20 seats total because of COVID. We're keeping uh, its size restricted, um, and a lot of those are gone. So if you're thinking about it, reserve a spot sooner than later. That's all I got. Thanks, everybody. Have a good Saturday. <laughs>